Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop, and this is the final fabricated element for this model. And I'm talking about the crankshaft right there. That is a nine-piece assembly if you do it according to the way the kit it dictates it being done. There are five round components and four bars that are identical, so that's a good thing. And let's just take a look at the kit itself. <laughs> there you go. There's your crankshaft kit, guys. Have at it. Each one of these gets thinned down, cut in half, and a couple of holes drilled in it, and the bar itself gets lopped into five different pieces. So four square, five round, and that's not really a big deal. The supplemental print that they give you looks something like this, so they do detail the lengths of all the individual components, give you the sizes, and if you have reamers, wonderful. If not, well, then bore it. I am going to go with the Loctite and pinned construction just because that's the way I care to do it. I am trying to have full mechanical engagement on all my parts here. I'm not going to weld or solder anything. So if you have a machine and you're not good with a torch, well then you're in luck. So first thing I'm going to do is take these little guys right here. I'm going to thin these down while they're still intact and then I'll cut them in half and make four identical pieces. That's a very good place to start. Let's do it. Well, the first step in the operation is to thin these things down to a, a print dimension. And you'll notice that I just placed it in there and set it, registered it on the parallels by hand. I'm marking which side is up. And there may be some creative editing between these parts for off-camera measurements. You'll also notice that I'm not tapping it down. If these parts are bent at all, if you tap it down, all you're going to do is translate the bend to a stress factor and when you release the vise the stress is then going to rebend the part for you without even trying. There you go. When it's the second side it's sometimes hard to tell which side is the second side so I put a little two on it and definitely tap it down. It's always a good idea if you're going to the nth degree to remove the skin from both sides of the part to assure that if there is any surface stress that it's been relieved. Got a piece on both ends of the vise right here and I am just cleaning up the ends. There is no specific overall length of these blanks being established right now. Just cleaning up the ends. With the stop set on the vise, the line on the top of the part will remain on top of the part which means I'm flipping it like a helicopter and not like a propeller on an airplane. I'll go into greater detail on the do's and don'ts of that particular process later on. And although you can't see it, I have the handle of the vise clocking to the exact same position every time as not to change the pressure on the part, potentially squash the part, or change the center dimension that I've established from the rear jaw. And for anybody that's curious about what if you have a chip between your part and the stop, very much like a 5C collet would at times, listen for the click. If when you register a part against the stop or inside of a collet, it feels like mushy or it feels like uh, soft as opposed to the nice solid click, well then you probably have something in there. Ring operation is first because it's just easier to do. I always put the machine in low gear from whatever speed I had from high gear, and just plunge it right straight through the part with lubrication. The larger hole on the end is a board operation and I don't know how many of these particular passes I'm going to show but I do rough bore these, rough bore these again and then finish them. Gentle pressure on it because of the thin wall on the outside of the larger hole the last thing you want to do is collapse the blank. There's no changing of the setting on the boring head for the final operation. The parts are just swapped out and the boring head remains set to the final position for all four pieces. I'm looking for approximately a one thousandths press fit to the final assembly.
All right, let's discuss a couple of things here that were probably not immediately obvious on accelerated video. First of all, there are four pieces here, not two. <laughs> Trust me, they will be cut off basically the same length. You know, there's a little bit longer, this piece, uh, it's hard to do through the lens. There you go. This piece on the top naturally is longer, but when they're cut off, they will be four identical parts. Now, if these holes were drilled off center, when you flip them, they are no longer going to be on the same center line. They will be the same distance from the edge to the center, but now on this part, it's this edge to the center that's the same. That's the first thing you want to take into consideration. So what I did, uh, you see the reflection? See a little notch on the corner? Right there. That is my bank zero. As this part was produced, that was the up against the stop, up against the jaw, zero datum corner. So when these parts are installed, if you want them to be true the way they were made, well, you want those little notches to be on the same edge at assembly. That way you can guarantee that the alignment is good. If it was off, which I know my setup was not off because I trammed it, if it were flipped over, you can see that corner now moves to the outside, and if there's any discrepancy, well, that's going to show up as an eccentricity this way, or a misalignment, an axial misalignment, and when you have a three journal crank, the center journal being out, that's going to be a problem. It's going to bind up, it's going to lock down when you tighten down those bearings, and it's not going to end well. So put some type of witness mark, a little center punch mark, something, anything to determine which way this thing was aligned when they were made. The other way to, to uh, guarantee that is to stack them. I'm sure a lot of you guys were typing away, burning out your fingernails trying to get that down, but stack them up, drill them up to the exact same time, but the same principle applies. You have to mark which way they were stacked because if it's off, well, now you got a problem and it's like scratching your head or... <laughs> Some other body part and go I don't know what happened but something happened so that's what happened all right that's number one confusing number one right play it back and listen to it again if it was confusing it won't be the second time around or maybe the third all right these holes you saw me drill them you saw me rough them you saw me rough them again rough them again and then the finish operation what you don't want to do is finish one hole while the other holes are roughed out that is because the load on the tool, as you're dialing this hole in, the very final cut you take, chances are it's going to be pretty small, and the load on the cutter is going to be very small, and all is going to end well, and you're going to say, man, I got me a perfect hole right there, I do. And then when you flip this around, put this one in, and it takes off a way big hog cut. This is either going to dig in and just leave a terrible finish and cut an oversized hole, or it's going to deflect from the load and leave an undersized hole. So at the end of the day, when you put your gauge pin in, you're going to say, yep, nailed it on this one. And this one's going to fall straight through and get lost in the black hole called the shop floor. So if you're going to creep up and take a jig board type finish pass setup like I did, creep up on them, creep up on all of them, and make sure that the final cut, if it's a single pass final cut, make sure that the load on the tool is exactly the same for each part and you will not be disappointed. All right, in summary, mark the zero corners, same load on the tool, everything is good. Let's cut these off, round some stuff off, and uh, move on to the pins. That wasn't all that bad, let's do it. When I'm done with this operation, these parts will be approximately 10 thousandths longer than the calculated finished overall length of the part. I am leaving approximately five on each end so that when I put these on a rotary table and round the ends off, it cleans up without a flat in the center, just strictly for cosmetic purposes. The radius basically means nothing and I just choose to do it on a rotary table for consistency. Using aluminum spacers on either side of a small part like this allows you to go beyond center with the part, or excuse me, with the cutter. And if you engage one of those aluminum inserts, well, I guess that's better than engaging the grinding vise that you're using to do the operation.
it's just a little insurance policy. Ideally, make sure the aluminum nest is thicker than the cutter and all should end well. Prior to putting the radius on the end of these parts, I took the liberty of putting a center punch mark where, where I, actually to determine the, the corner that I had knocked off since the radius was going to cut that corner off and I knew that I put the little center punch mark on so when these things are assembled they'll all go in the same direction. Be real careful not to squash these when you do this operation as you could very easily collapse these holes I guess this is going to be a press fit for a 281 stock and the way I had the rotary table set up the radius on this end is the center here and the radius on this end is the center here that's exactly the way it works out and calculates on the print if you do the math so that might save you a little time thinking about that one radius is going to be about a couple thousands under the other one and I went to a different number on the digital to allow for that because once you take the material off of this and flip it over your banking surface and your starting blank overall length have changed so keep that in mind if you're really getting critical and if you want to do this on a sander that's perfectly fine too but I chose to do it this way now right, let's move on to the pins and uh, see if we can make this crank finished that would be awesome and yes I will have to rub that down on a piece of emery and get those tool marks out of there so save the comments. Yep, they're going to be gone. Don't worry about it. All right, let's do some lathe work. The crank is composed of five individual round segments, four different pieces. So there is one set of duplicates, and that is where the uh, crosshead rod, connecting rod, connects. First thing I do is take the, the burrs off of the outside so that when it goes in the collet it registers and sits cleanly. And just clean up one end. This is not necessarily the opposite side of the first part that you see me do. So I like to clean up the ends of all the pieces first. That's a good way to start. A little helper when you flip a part around to bring it to overall length is to put some black sharpie marker or ink or dicum or something on the end of the part. It's a lot easier to see the tool making contact. Right there. And if you do have a digital, I usually set my digital to about five tenths over. Or back the tool out five tenths and re-zero it. That is a great technique. I've been using Sharpie on the end of a part for many, many years, and it's incredibly accurate. If you're going to take a good facing cut or a good turning pass on the end of a part, and there's any possibility of that part pushing back into the collet, take a light OD pass first. And it will be immediately visible if it pushes back into the collet because the second pass will not terminate in the same spot. Now it's unfair with the editing capabilities I'm using here that these parts are being measured in between these cuts but I've just edited that out because there's no sense in you looking at a machine just sitting there idle. There is a stop currently inside this collet where there was no stop prior to. These are the small parts that get the journal turned on the end. And I'm roughing them down, getting them real close, and I will set the carriage, set the cross slide, everything to the final size without moving the cross slide and turn all four pieces to the exact same dimension. And these are the finished passes. Approximately a 7,000's final cut.
I am using a pair of old needle nose pliers that I sanded back and used the die grinder to put a little radius in between the jaws instead of the flats and it makes a great pin puller. Everybody's got a pair of beat up needle nose hanging around somewhere. Don't throw them away. Repurpose them. I've used that little pair of pliers for about 45 years. When I'm done turning the diameters here, I will reset the carriage to establish the overall length of the part and face the back shoulder off, going just a thousandth or two below to make sure that I have a square corner. When I press these things together, it's nice and clean. All right, let's take a look at the final components. And we're going to make some notes here, tell you a couple things you should know about what you're looking at. These you've already seen, so no big deal up there. But these little guys down here are something to be considered. The center portion of this guy right here, which is going to go between two of these throws, and dictate the gap between those throws, has absolutely got to be just a little bit bigger than the width of the crank. And I mean just a little bit. You don't want this thing walking back and forth in there. Up. Mine's about two thousandths bigger. That's not a whole lot, but I trust that after I press this thing together, I'm going to have the clearance that I need. And when all else fails, you can just take a little bit off of these surfaces here if you want a little bit more room. I've got a calculated groove in here based on the center of the piston minus half of one of these pins because that's how basically it goes together, right? So half of this distance here plus the distance from the center to center of the steam chest plus the gasket plus the 782 to the center of the cylinder should give you where that belongs right there. And in my book, in my world, that is 884 from here to the center of that groove, 884. Okay, so once this is pressed on, that groove should fall right exactly where the eccentric strap connects to the crank without scarring up the crank. Alright, I'm saying that a lot lately because it's about a million degrees where I'm sitting. When you put this thing together, the sequential press operation, you got to be real careful if you're pressing this thing together and it's not a slip fit. These will start but they won't go all the way and they're going to be pinned anyway. So the real heavy press is on these guys right here. It's about a thousand, thousandth and a half press on the eccentric part of that. Be careful. I'm going to color code the drawing so you can see what I'm doing as I do it. Which sets of components I will prefab and at the end I can squeeze everything together. So having some large L shape. Let's move that out for a second. So having large L shaped components like that is probably... <laughs> in your best interest when it comes to assembling pieces like this. You can squeeze this, but once it's all together it's going to be a little harder to squeeze. So be very careful about the sequence of events here. And I'll mark up the print, put the camera up, let's put this thing together. The colored dots on this particular drawing tell me what I can and cannot get away with when assembling this crank. I can press this piece into one of the throws, I can press this piece into one of the throws, and that gives me a three-piece red assembly. Let's say put that on the side. Now you have another throw, another crank journal, another throw, and there's an offset journal down here. You can put this on the center or you can put it with the end, which is why there's two dots on that. So you have a one, two, three piece assembly here, one, two, three piece assembly here, one, two, three piece assembly here. So basically it's just three pieces that go together rather easily. Once you put these two assemblies together, you clock the throws and it should be in line. Same thing with this side, clock the throws and it should be in line. The only part that is really critical is clocking the 90 degrees between this inside throw and this inside throw which is laying down 90 degrees okay that is the only thing you really got to watch out for and then make sure all of the throws are clocked correctly when you lay them together and it should squeeze just fine I am NOT going to weld anything pin anything or Loctite anything 
until after I rechuck this in a collet and make sure everything is running true as it should. Then I'll put it in the base, clamp it down, make sure it spins, then I'll jig it and pin it. For now, let's just put a couple of these sub-assemblies together. This one, this one, and let's do the little one because you can still hold it in a vise and squeeze it for a final assembly. I like that. Let's do it. This particular setup is one that I use quite often when I do something like this, a V-block sitting on a parallel across the center of the Kurt vise, and just use the movable side to smash parts together. These vices can apply a tremendous amount of force, and this is a great way to assemble pieces and keep them lined up. Sometimes it's a little easier than holding the part vertically. And in my own defense, there is a lot of time edited out of these particular segments because it did take a little while to figure out how to space and adjust the pins and parallels and everything else. That is a gauge pin currently in that V-block. And all that does is just extend the stationary jaw forward for shorter pins. Quick change of the setup and an adjustment on that gauge pin and we're ready for the shorter pieces that go between the throws. Alright, let's take a look at the components. We've got the one long end subcomponent. This will ultimately be the end that goes on here. You can see you can squeeze from the outside real easy and line them up. That's good. The throw on this end has to be clocked at 90 degrees up or down, whichever way the drawing calls out for, but it has to be clocked at 90 degrees. And then this end that's already clocked at 90 will be installed parallel to this end and squeezed together, and that should be the end of it. Let's see if I can figure out a way to clock this at 90, squeeze it all together, and actually finish this part there. That'd be great. Clocking the center throws to 90 degrees was no big deal. One is registered flat against the parallel, and one is vertical against the 1, 2, 3 block. However, when I squeeze this down, the vise will stop short because I pinched the 1, 2, 3 block against that parallel. Feels nice and tight, right? Yep, all is well. And when I flip the part over, surprise, surprise, I'm 60,000 short of being flush. Time to put it back in and remove the 1, 2, 3 block. There is no set blueprint on how to rig your machine or whatever you're going to use to assemble this crank. But try to keep everything parallel, try to keep it flat, try to keep it clocked. And everything should end well. This was a little frustrating to do this. It seemed like I needed two more hands and a couple more one through three blocks to make this happen. But in the end, everything clocked straight under pressure and went together as expected. The one, two, three block to the right of the screen was crowding the end journal just a little bit and needed to be pushed out of the way in order to keep that center block from kicking up. All right, let's try it out in the base and see if it works with all the bearings. Uh, a highly unlikely, I think it's going to need to be bumped, just my gut. But everything was nice and smooth, went in nice and straight. We'll see if it works across three points. Good. Okay, now to keep this guy from jiggling back and forth, I'm going to put some pressure on the center cap. I'm not going to put the screws in. Looking down on the screw holes, they will line up. Let's see what we got.
like it. A little bit of bumping going on as you turn it. Could be a burr on something or could just need to run in. So I think I'm going to leave it be. I will put it back in the collet. And I did put it in the collet off screen and check the concentricity. It does run very well across all the journals. But of course, just like anything else, it's nine jillion pieces. I did have to bump it to get the end to run in true. Is that about three thousandths? But on something like this, three thousandths is three thousandths too much. This is the fixture that I'll be using to pin the crank. And I'll tell you, the small journals on the end here, the ones that are going to be connected to the rod, were turned down and pressed in. And you can see the difference in the wall thickness right here versus the wall thickness of the main journal itself. Now, I'm just going to say that ideally I feel on the print and in the instructions it should have said to relieve the main crank segments the same way. When you go and try to pin this like they've suggested, like they've instructed, this area right here, any material that you remove from that effectively then translates to four tiny little webs per journal holding this thing together. So instead of using a big pin, I'm going to use a 062 pin. It's about a millimeter and a half. But if I were to do this again, or if I were to be using this engine for propulsion in a, a steamship or a locomotive of some sort, I would definitely prepare the main crank arms, not the arms, but the, the shaft itself, the main crank shaft segments, the same way I did the rod ends here. Turn them down, leave yourself a whole lot more meat here. It's going to be a whole lot stronger. It's a simple V-block fixture, one long V-channel in it, and I really wish that I could have had this surface down here establish the parallelism of these, but you can see the asymmetry in the throw itself. It's thinner on the side than it is on the bottom, so when you go to a vertical position like this, it still has to clear. I will indicate the center of the shaft itself to get my center line and then I'm just going to sweep the inside and move off half the thickness of the throw for each one. I do like the way that fixture looks so it didn't take all that long and it was made from a piece of scrap guy so if anybody says well you know I don't have big chunks of aluminum laying around neither do I that I can dispose of like this but this is a waste chunk that I bandsawed actually out of another part to make like a horseshoe bracket. So don't throw anything away, you never know when it's going to come in handy. Let's put this camera on a tripod and put some pins in these. Two thirty-five EW just means two thirty-five each way from the indicated center of that gap. I'm going to center drill them, and I'm going to take my sweet time pecking away at this, going across two interruptions, and I'm breaking through, and then I'm going into a softer material in the fixture. And the last thing I want to do at this stage in the game is snap that drill off in that part. I would probably just turn the machine off, turn the lights out, and go home. Okay, now for anybody that's going to ask what the pilot hole size was versus the reamer size, I left about four thousandths of an inch in that hole. The smaller the hole, the smaller the amount of material I leave behind. The or prior to reaming. The bigger the hole, naturally, the more I put in there, the more I leave prior to reaming. Now, it all depends on the speed, the feed, the lubrication, the type of material, the condition of the reamer. Results may vary. So, I left four. I do believe I'm going to be successful with that. And looking at the camera angle, I'm going to have to deburr these. Actually, I'm not going to deburr them at all. I'm just going to put the pins in there now so everything stays put. I will rotate the crank. 90 degrees to the rear and for anyone wondering I use shims underneath the throws to establish the parallel relationship prior to drilling it. 
The wax the setting will remain the same. I know what it is center to center. I will still indicate the other side, but you just saw me do that. So next operation that you'll see is me peening the pins over and cleaning them off. Prior to the installation of these little pins, I took a flat chisel and I put a little ding mark in the center. That will raise the surface just enough to apply the resistance so that I can position this without this falling through or uh, moving on its own. Doesn't take much. And I do apologize for the camera wiggle. There's a big fan on me and this is on a long boom. So that's the wind doing that. Well, it's just no fun unless you put something together, right? I think I'm going to leave the pins protruding from the throws like that. I just like the way it looks. It almost looks like a riveted assembly, which it practically is. Leave a comment in the comment line if you think I should shave them off or not. But I kind of like the way it looks. It's not going to get in the way of anything. And there it is. I am very pleased with that. And if you see a little bit of shine to my skin, the heat index today is about 115 degrees. And oh, but it's a dry heat. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It's humid and it's uh, terrible. So there you go. Crankshaft is done. We're going to check that off the list. And with the exception of drilling some portholes, some small pins to keep things in place, uh, like the center of the main bearing and such, I'm going to mount the piping off camera. And hopefully in the next couple of days, we will have an assembly video, but this model fabrication is complete. The crankshaft was the last element. I know I was looking forward to it. I hope you were too. And wherever you are in the world, I hope you're well and happy and safe and cool. I uh, wish I was cool, but I'm not temperature wise. It's just brutal. Anyway, thank you for spending some of your time with me today. I do appreciate it. Me, I'm calling this one a day. Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. I'm out.